Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wednesday Build. This is episode 1.19, and today we're going to be discussing the topic, Legal Tech Pedagogy, Lessons Learned as Gavel's Global Ambassador to Law Schools, featuring fellowships, foundations, and future opportunities. My name is Brittany Hernandez, and I'm very excited to be discussing this topic today. It's something I think about a lot. You're welcome to call me the bee emoji or bee or peanut or brittle, as my dad and my uncle like to call me. I'm from San Diego, California, but I'm based in London now. And I previously served on active duty in the United States military. I then became a lawyer, used the GI Bill to pay for law school, practiced intellectual property and entertainment law in California, and then later founded my own practice, Chromium Law, and my own business, Command Kamai LLC, which stands for where knowledge meets application and implementation, which is going to really factor into what we're talking about today, which is that kind of knowledge piece versus implementation and app application. <clears throat> Uh, I still had a couple of uh, uh, about 11 months left on my um, GI Bill after graduating from law school. So I went on to get a master's degree in international film business from the University of Exeter and the London Film School, which is how I ended up here in London, um, which led me to a job, my first job in legal technology, which was actually as a business development executive and partner engagement executive at a legal tech startup out of Scotland called Vala. Um, I went on to become a gavel expert, so I worked with GigLaw as a freelance automator, uh, where I utilized the tool of gavel as well as just other no code tools in order to automate for other lawyers and law firms, um, their different packages and contracts and things like that. So what's really interesting and uh, great about being a gavel expert, as we'll kind of go into in today's conversation is the ability to work under any jurisdiction because you aren't actually practicing law, you're, you, are, um, you are in the legal space, maybe as a lawyer, you could say with a lawyer um, background or, or education, but your actual practice is to develop applications and workflows for let's say other lawyers or within law firms or for companies. So. So that gives you a lot of freedom, which is something we're going to talk about next week around self-determination and freedom and um, kind of creative expression, you could say. So while I was, uh, you know, practicing as a gavel expert and automating, I was invited by Dorna Moini, the founder and CEO of Gavel, to become the global ambassador to law schools for them, which has been an amazing experience and really opened my mind to the different opportunities that are available, as well as this topic around legal tech pedagogy and how to teach legal technology to the next generation of lawyers, as well as current lawyers, um, and maybe people who are in that transition period of trying to determine what they want to do. Um, maybe they want to move away from traditional legal practice and more towards this legal technology movement. <clears throat> um, I also, that was kind of the big impetus for me to also create the Law Students and Legal Tech Access to Justice Fellowship for Gavel under my role as Global Ambassador to Law Schools, where we really had at the time, and this is what we're going to spend a lot of time on today, is we really wanted to speak directly to the students and give them direct opportunities to be involved in what we're doing and what we're teaching. So we didn't want to always have to go through a middle person to talk to the students. So a lot of the time where I am talking to someone who's in the career and professional development department or in the law library or who's a professor or a director of some kind, and they serve as kind of the middle person between me um, teaching this particular topic to the students and the students themselves, um, which is fine and works in many different ways, but there's less of the ability to have that direct relationship with the students um, to really talk about what, what is happening in the legal field, what we're seeing from the, the marketplace perspective and a creation standpoint. So we created this particular fellowship to kind of directly talk to and create relationships with the students and feed them directly into job opportunities after the hackathon competition. Um, so I also am the founder, course creator, and senior instructor of Chromium Academy, where we have Gavel certification courses, as well as certification courses in Go Full Page and instruction in Softer and Airtable and Zapier and things like that. So um, I'm also the creator and host of the Lightning Talks for Legal Innovators series in partnership with Gavel, as well as this particular weekly show, The Wednesday Build, and the creator of the free interactive digital magazine, Codeword Hex, which comes out every Tuesday, 
uh, along with the Tuesday forecast, which is a free newsletter where we talk about different upcoming events um, and kind of get the community together. I'm also finally the founder of Korean Retreat, where once a year I get together with other high achievers and female founders in beautiful places around the world, where we get to connect and learn from each other and grow our businesses. To, this year, we're actually going to Portugal, which will be really fun. Last year, we went to Brighton here in England, which was awesome. So let's go ahead and get started on today's topic. So I thought it would be useful in this conversation around legal tech pedagogy and this kind of lessons learned as my in my role as Gavel's Global Ambassador to Law Schools. I felt that this would be a really good opportunity to dive into what we actually taught the students in the fellowship, because a lot of the conversation around what we actually learned um, was really between me and the fellows because it was built lean, meaning, which is one of the points I want to make here, which is that you can build and teach in a lean way. And sometimes that's better than a sort of stagnant um, or static sort of format because the format, the, the, the actual platforms themselves are changing so rapidly that we need to keep up as educators of those platforms by going about this in a lean way. So maybe we're, instead of pre-recording 10 different, you know, recordings of some type of um, instruction about these different platforms, it might actually be more beneficial to build it in a lean format where you're actually building week by week by week um, in real time so that you're able to quickly adapt to changes rather than having to go back and maybe re-record something, for example. So oftentimes, you know, this is a live format type of thing for people who are, you know, directors of legal clinics or um, professors in law schools because they have live classes. However, maybe the curriculum and the syllabus was um, was actually created, you know, a year in advance and all of the maybe guest lectures were, were booked out months in advance. So it's a lot harder to adapt something that is so um, preset and maybe has to be approved as well. So in the context of my role, what's really nice about it is that I don't have that sort of same type of approval process for a lot of these different projects. I do still need to get approval, but my approval process is one person who gets to say yes or no. And I just pitch the idea, we refine it, and then we can come up with these um, very malleable and pliable options for students to be able to access education around legal technology. So in this particular case, that's what happened. So I was able to talk to Dorna about what I thought might be a good way to talk directly to the students, offer them an opportunity to get a more uh, in-depth familiarity with the tool. And that kind of comes with this fellowship program. So I'm going to go deep into kind of what we talked about, what we created together, the hackathon we did together, and what the outcome was. Um, and then also just kind of talking about this piece around foundation. So that was going to be this first part where I'm going to talk about the first week we went over, uh, the, the different topics we went over, as well as the kind of decision to include future opportunities or a feeder program sort of into directly guaranteed positions as automators. So let's first talk about what is the Law Students and Legal Tech Access to Justice Fellowship. So the Law Students and Legal Tech Access to Justice Fellowship was a program that we just finished recently as of last Wednesday, uh, which made it to where we were empowering the next generation of lawyers with the tools, skills, network, and real world experience to succeed in this rapidly shifting legal landscape. So we provided free Gavel accounts and full a full scholarship for students uh, for a curated 12 week certification course, which I built uh, from scratch lean for the students week by week. We also had a hackathon competition, which had three cash prizes of $1,000 each, plus a special swag prize for the team with the or the individual who created the most creative marketing campaign. We also had guaranteed paid positions waiting for the winners on the other side of the hackathon competition uh, with Gig Law for the hackathon's um, teams, and then real world legal tech experience building access to justice apps, which was the focus of this particular hackathon and program was how can we utilize technology in a way that increases access to justice. So as I mentioned, this was a 12 week 
course. And then we had a two week content break. And then we went into the hackathon competition after that. So this is now closed, but we are considering how we might be able to do this again in the future for other cohorts. Um, in this particular cohort, we had about um, 83 applicants. And then we had, um, and there were from about eight different countries and we had many different states and schools involved. I think it was over 32 different universities were involved. Um, you know, and a lot of what we saw was that we wanted to be able to have this be open to any year of school. So students who were at 1Ls, 2Ls, or 3Ls all could apply and be part, become part of it. Um, and then also recent graduates within one year, as well as participants in legal incubator programs. The reason that we put the participants in incubator programs piece in here is that's actually how I was able to find um, gavel, which later became my current profession. So I was also a recent graduate within one year, but I wasn't technically still a student and I was participating in the access to law initiative um, with my school, which helped sole pr practitioners um, kind of figure out how to be a sole practitioner, how to get cl clients, how to price, how to um, think about pro bono hours and how you can give back. Um, and so on. So that was really useful for me. That's how I was able to kind of participate in this um, sort of hackathon back in 2020, which is the one that I kind of now ran this particular year. So it really came full circle for me um, personally in this particular experience. But with this, um, you know, this was so this was kind of how we did this. And we also wanted to have a couple of judges for the hackathon competition that would know the level of sophistication of each application be by interacting with them because we've built them ourselves. So I was a judge along with Haley Leviashvili of Giglaw, which is the, the, the company that was going to be guaranteeing positions. Tracy Troyer, who is a lawyer as well as an automator. She has her own practice called Troyer and Good. And she has her own company called Accessio Docs, which helps people learn how to automate or access automators and they kind of donated the, this opportunity for the winners to be featured on the professional automator directory um, on the Accessor Docs website, as well as Dorna Moini, who was one of the other judges as well, who's the founder and CEO of Gavel, the platform itself. So that's a little bit about the Law Students in Legal Tech Access Justice Fellowship itself. So now we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about the pedagogy itself. So my academy, Chromium Academy, hosted the fellowships content um, and I kind of served as the facilitator, you could say. Um, and so this made it to where uh, students were able to have their own dashboards. So we have this um, sort of dedicated online or digital environment for the students to interact with the material. It also made it to where all of the Zoom links could be included here for all of the live sessions. Um, and then that's also how they're generating their certificates at the end, which include a basic certificate for the Gavel platform. So I wanted to, us to kind of go through this piece by piece and talk about the decisions that I made and we made sort of as uh, facilitators of the program at each step at, at each stage and why and like what we built along the way and how that kind of helped the students. So in this is what the dashboard looks like. So this is built with Thinkific. Um, so Thinkific is a sort of a course platform through the academy. So when we started, I gave them an overview, obviously, of what were we going to be talking about. We went over and had a syllabus where I talked about the program and what to expect. And the way that I structured it was that we had seven parts to the program. So we had foundations, frameworks, and functionality, building an MVP. Part two was applied to an access to justice app for disabled veterans. Part three was applied to your own access to justice app idea. Part four was incorporated into your harmonized business plan. Part five is prepared to launch hackathon prep and launch strategy. Then we took a break in part six for people who had law school exams. And then part seven was the hackathon competition itself. So the structure of the fellowship was actually broken down into these seven parts. Foundations, talking about MVPs, application to an access to justice app that we built together, then something that they build on their own and develop on their own, talking about how this fits into a harmonized business plan, talking about hackathon prep and launch strategy, talk about things like marketing, um, reaching a different audience, 
uh, who is your target market versus who is your end user, taking a break, and then we went into the hackathon competition itself. So that was the syllabus that I prepared for the students. And then um, I just kind of went through how they can create their accounts. And then we talked about access to justice and we gave some foundational knowledge so that we could all be on the same page as to what exactly we were talking about. So as I mentioned, we're talking about fellowships, foundations, and future opportunities. So on the foundation side of this, I wanted them to have a base understanding of what is access to justice that they haven't heard that term before. What is the justice gap? What does that mean? What's the opportunity here? So in this particular piece, we see that the LSC explains that low income Americans do not get the help they need for 92% of their civil legal problems. And that 74% of low income households that face at least one, uh, they actually face at least one civil legal problem. And that 42% of those surveys said that they did not seek legal help because of cost concerns. So taken together, this means that there's a justice gap for almost 50 million low-income Americans. And then if you expand that to the world, that can be, you know, exponentially more people. So that's where we come in as people who are trained in the law and now going to be also trained in technology and how we can harness and utilize technology to uh, fill this justice gap and making it to where uh, it does this by reducing the cost, and especially in the no-code space, reducing the cost to the lawyer to create solutions, as well as then driving down the price of particular services in one area because you're able to scale to more people. So even though it seems like you are reducing your services pricing as the lawyer, what you're actually doing is expanding your ability to reach this justice gap because it's now affordable for all of these different people. And I understand that not every service can be digitized and that there's <laughs> or turned into a, an application or a workflow of some kind. And that's why you know people will still need lawyers, but you can do it in a way that incorporates aspects of your practice that are DIY related or maybe um, more efficient, made more efficient or made more independent of your time um, using technology and especially no code technology um, in order to fulfill the needs of your customers and making sure or your clients and making sure that this gap is filled. So we talked a little bit in the week one about access to justice itself. And then we talked about what's expected of you now in this new landscape of the law and the legal industry um, as somebody who is what's called the T-shaped lawyer. So when I was kind of first getting introduced into legal technology back in 2020, when I first graduated, I went through Bucharest uh, Law School Legal Tech Essentials course, as well as a course called Passport to Practice, which is actually where I met Dorna and kind of got introduced to people like Gabe Tenenbaum and, um, and all these different kind of people who play a big role in the space today. So we could talk here about the T-shaped lawyer, um, what the, our responsibility is as far as substantive knowledge of the law, as well as uh, technical knowledge of um, technology and practical knowledge around technology. Uh, so we talked about that a little bit. And then also the O-shaped lawyer, which kind of talks about more on the sort of empathy side and customer relationship side, I think. So this one is more around how can we how can we put together this T-shaped lawyer model as well as tie that into the O-shaped lawyer model where you combine substantive law, uh, practical technical knowledge, as well as client relationships. So having the empathy piece. Um, and then we talked about the three layers of legal technology and the different types of legal technology, because not all of them relate to specifically to things like um, application building. Uh, some are more on the contract cycle uh, management side or the kind of uh, client management portal type of thing. So there's different classifications for the different types of, um, of legal technology. I also gave them the option to go into the history of legal tech, legal ops, and legal innovation. Um, so they had the option to watch this, which has Dan Katz going through the history for uh, kind of all the way back 
around why it was considered sort of more of an artisan or bespoke sort of um, profession and then having that kind of lead into more of this scalable productized uh, kind of legal services delivery that we have today. Then we talked about shifting business models in the legal industry. This is kind of moving away from the kind of traditional billing structure of the billable hour and more towards things like flat fees, subscription models, things like that. So um, I kind of gave them an introduction there and then an introduction to legal productization and scaling specifically in legal services and gave them the option to go through a case study of Hello Divorce, which is built on Gavel um, and has VC funding and investment from people like Jack Newton of Clio, which is really interesting to see as well. We then started talking about an introduction to what is agile methodology. So now we're talking about development and software development itself and how we can start thinking like lawyer developers. So we're kind of have this background of what is our understanding of access to justice? What's our understanding of who we're supposed to be now as lawyers and what that looks like? And then also going into what types of technology are out there? What's the history of it? As well as the shifting business models, what is productization? What is scaling? Seeing what that looks like in real life and now talking about when you're developing, what are those models? So we have agile and we also have lean. And then we have Lean and Six Sigma applied to process improvement in the legal industry. Then I talked about what is a minimum viable product, which is the basis of every, the starting point for any application, which is when we strip down what we actually need in order to make this product viable, meaning something we could actually put in front of someone to test it what would that look like? So this is without all of the bells and whistles. This is without a lot of customization from a CSS standpoint or style perspective and focusing really on the functionality of a product to say, okay, if we strip everything down, what do we actually need in order to make this? So looking back and we're thinking about thinking about how to teach legal technology, what I might have done instead of having these kind of separated out like this, um, I might have had a single session instead where I went through and just kind of explained these concepts into one. So it didn't look so overwhelming. Um, but at the same time, it did kind of give some space for each of these concepts to live. Um, so in the future, maybe I would be a little bit more concentrated here on Sort of getting us started, but we did need to set some type of foundation of an understanding and a common basis for what we're actually talking about here. So then I kind of went through and introduced the students to what is Gavel, like what, what are we using it for, like what are the different elements of it. I gave them kind of an overview of what the platform looks like it, and what everything, what every button is doing and sort of just gave them a broad overview. We also talked about Notion. So I love using Notion. Notion is a great tool. It's also a great companion editor for Gavel if from a, like a kind of a formatting perspective. It is a bit of a hack. So it's maybe not the best practice from a um, understanding perspective. So maybe that's one thing I would change here too is maybe I would have them learn the the sort of traditional way of doing it first and then the hack way, but I want them to be super efficient and to not waste time and so on and so on. So I, you know, always striving towards efficiency and lean processes. So I think in the future, I would kind of, yeah, just kind of tweak this a little bit to uh, teach them that and then the hack. But so I introduced them to Gavel, introduced them to Notion, and then I have them build along with me in this particular um, video where we start to create the framework for what I call the interactive resume. So I'll show you what that looks like quickly. So um, if we go into my dashboard here from my A2J dashboard, you'll see I have my Demi e Demo interactive resume. So this was the first project. And the reason I wanted this to be the first project is for a couple of reasons. And this goes into kind of the teaching legal tech piece. 
The reason I wanted to start with the interactive resume is one, it's always really good to start with something that they know, the students actually know, which is themselves. They know themselves, they know their name and their educational background and their experience and their certifications and they have their resumes and so on. So that's a really good starting point because you don't have to teach them anything as an entry point to getting started. You don't have to teach them some aspect of the law or some, um, you know, super technical aspects of this in order to just get started. We can just say, put your experience here, put your education here, put your this and that here. And it's also fun because you're getting to interact with your own information as well as this new technology. So with that being said, also from a technical standpoint of teaching legal tech, we have an interested person who will have already access to this type of information. And it also from a technical side teaches the person how to create question types, what is a drop down or multi select, and how to use things like logic. So, show this if which aspect is education, for example. So, I also taught them how to use something called markdown, which is these um, kind of asterisks as well as the things that create bullet points. Um, and I showed them how to use the hack of Notion uh, in order to kind of do this more quickly as well. Um, and then also how to create links like this. So it started to teach them the little pieces of um, this kind of initial MVP taught them basic things like question logic, how to create questions and things like that. So we had this kind of first initial bit. Then I introduced them to softer and we use softer to create our personal profiles. So that looks like this. Not everyone looks exactly the same as mine, but the elements of pieces are going to be the same where they have ability to book a time, sign in, sign up and go back home, um, you know, name and sort of like this header and a picture and then these three pieces and so on. So in the beginning, it didn't look all the way like this, but it was just a basic piece. And then what would happen is we would have them link their interactive resume off from this personal website. So let me just move this around a tiny bit quickly. So um, so that was kind of the piece that we're doing here. So we created the framework for our personal websites and builder profiles using Softer. Um, and then we connected our interactive resumes and our LinkedIn profiles and our Calendly pages to our Softer websites or builder profiles. So that's the piece here where you see book a time. So I had them all create Calendly pages um, or accounts, which are free. So I wanted this to be something that they could walk away from this experience having a full stack of tech for free. So they have a free Gavel account, they have a free Softer account, they have a free Asana account, and they know how to use these different pieces. They have a free Calendly account, they have their LinkedIn, they have all of these different pieces, a free Canva account, um, and so on. And also Thinkific, for example, in order to create courses. So all of these different pieces, including HubSpot as well, um, and Zapier and Airtable and all of these different pieces came together to form the fellowship and the basis for all of the things that we did together. So in this particular week, just from week one, they're already creating a website, creating their interactive resumes and starting to really understand kind of Notion as well and how these different pieces can interact with each other. Um, so for their assignment, they had to create their frameworks or their MVPs and connect them to each other and also to join the community. So uh, they were able to join the Slack community that we have for Gavel, which is really, really active and really serves as a great way for peer learning and peer sharing of best practices. So that is something that I really wanted them to, to do as well. So when we got into week two, we wanted to make sure that they knew how to create new pages and something like a contact form, for example, using softer um, and a link to the homepage, for example. Um, we went into then, so now that they understood a little bit how to create something like this with um, sort of basic pieces of multi-select options and we have question logic here, then I wanted them to learn how to utilize the word add-in that is really powerful from Gavel. So let me just pull that up really quickly as well. So if we open this up, you'll see that I have the document tagger here from Gavel. And I'm just going to stop sharing for a second so you don't see my API key. Um, 
but let me open up the um, correct client name and then open this up. So you have the ability to create API keys um, within Gavel, which makes it to where you're able to really kind of connect to so many different third-party tools as well and do so many different things. So in this particular example, you use an API key that you create within Gavel in order to connect your account to this Word add-in. So the Word add-in allows you to see the different workflows that you've created and interact with them in a really easy, no-code, um, tagging kind of friendly way. So once people have understood how to do this, so basically what I had them do is I gave them a template for sort of a resume and cover letter. And then I had them go through and um, sort of tag up the, um, the document uh, with particular um, questions. So that relates to whether somebody would like a customized PDF version of a cover letter and a resume. They can say yes or no. I also taught them how to use an, this kind of collapse and expand um, toggle and how to use embeds such as video embeds within Gavel as well. You can also see that I taught them how to have no header and change the kind of font style as well um, through the use of um, sort of a link that you can get from the um, Gavel Learning Center. So I taught them how to do this by uh, focusing on the word add-in, creating API keys and linking them together, um, how to include a PDF version of your cover letter and resume within your interactive resume. So that's kind of this piece here where when somebody says yes, they're taken to this page where I taught them how to create this, what's called a combo box. So somebody can say, Ms. Brittany Hernandez and say, let's uh, say, Carmen Kamaya LSB, for example, and how to create something called a preview page where the person can see here their information has been inserted into the, um, so we have the date, we have the uh, name of the company, we have the name, title and name of the person, we have the company's name here as well, um, and so on. So you can see how this was uh, personalized for the person who is interacting with it. They can also open the PDF here at the end um, and they can get taken back to the builder profile, which is where they would have started which is would have been their starting point. I also taught the students how to create this button in here um, and to change the name of the actual output document and make it to where it's only a PDF and not a Word document that shows at the end. So with what you can see here from a legal tech pedagogy perspective is you can see that we're building one piece at a time over these different weeks. So we started with kind of more of um, still kind of a pretty robust MVP from both a Gavel perspective um, as well as a software perspective is, and also linking those pieces together all within the first week. And we can do that because of the, the quick nature of building with no code technology. So here we were able to create an interactive resume or like it's the framework for that a software website and can link those things together. And then in the week two, we went through and worked on the word add-in, tagging variables with that, and then uploading that and having that be a preview document as well as an output document at the end. So we then went on to, as I mentioned, incorporating this as a preview of the cover letter and resume, how to add that kind of custom CSS, which I talked about with taking off the header, um, which sometimes you would want to do and sometimes you wouldn't. Sometimes you would want people to be able to log in or see your um, logo, for example. Also how to change your themes in softer to add personality and custom styling. So that's kind of when we went through and started to really make this cohesive from an aesthetic perspective to make it our own. Um, and then adding things like background images, button styles, and so on. Images and descriptions. Um, so that makes it to where when you share the link with someone, um, it's not just kind of like a grayed out box that has just the name of the site, but instead you have like a nice image that has the, the title that you chose for that page. So I showed them how to do that. So they really got deep into things like softer as well as gavel. We got a little bit into notion, but not super deep into notion. Um, 
Then I also show them how to use Vimeo record so that if they wanted to create videos like this in the future and incorporate those, how to do so, like I showed you at the beginning of this particular one, um, which is here. So if they wanted to add something like this here, also, if they wanted to add something like that to their uh, personal websites, I showed them how to do that in my original version there. I had a video here, which I have now kind of hidden. Um, because it looks so different now that we're towards the end or like now that we've completed it, we've changed so much. Um, but I've also shown them how to change what's called the favicon, which is here up at the top of a tab. So we kind of went through those little bits um, and then how to test the workflow from the end user's perspective and fix bugs along the way, as well as adding Zoom to your Calendly account. So we kind of went through all of these different pieces, as well as we had a bonus where you could create a testing environment, two ways to add a hyperlink and an introduction to Markdown here. So, um, so I was just showing them as well from a kind of practical perspective, it's always really good to have a testing environment. So I love to teach when I'm teaching people about um, Gavel or even software or any other tool. It's always really good to have a place where you can make mistakes without affecting the whole outcome of the entire, uh, the entire workflow that maybe you've been working on for a really long time. So then I gave them an assignment each week. So I did feel that having the assignments of, especially having hands-on building every week was really important. So I loved the fact that we were able to have them build something every single week with their hands, that they were able to build websites, that they were able to build workflows and applications. And each week they had to turn something in that I could then go through and make sure that each, they hit each point as well as that they were paying attention to detail because in this particular type of development process, as well as in practicing law, it's so important to have that really hyper focus on attention to detail, because even just having changing one thing from, um, you know, something that's capitalized to something that's lowercase, or removing an underscore or having a period that's not supposed to be there, and so on, all of these different pieces come together to, um, to kind of make or break something that you're building. So we got to go through that in the fellowship and uh, really make sure that each week they're getting more and more and more confident in their ability to build with these tools. So as we go on to um, this kind of week three, I started to introduce them to things like um, customer relationship management, as well as just like sort of the concept or idea of it, as well as things like HubSpot. I had them create their free HubSpot accounts and to kind of learn how to create contacts and to connect things like your Gmail account to it so that you can have sort of a centralized inbox for how you're interacting with your customers, connecting that as a channel, connecting that in a form to the software website. So right now and how they kind of ended it is they have a contact form here, which takes them to this sort of um, HubSpot form where the person can interact and give them a message, which then sends that to the HubSpot email and so on. Um, and so we kind of got into a little bit of that. Then we went into Dovetail for market research. So Dovetail used to have a free forever plan. They now have, um, I think they don't have it anymore. They just have a 14 day free trial. And they've changed a lot of couple of things around since I first taught this. So I might kind of reconsider how I teach this, but I do think Dovetail is really good, obviously for tagging and sort of finding different patterns within um you know kind of within your different recordings of interviews with users or clients so it's such a powerful tool um i just from the perspective of teaching legal tech i wanted them to come away or the fellows to come away from this experience having a full tech stack that they could have for free so um they kind of did get locked out of this at, towards the end because at maybe like week 10 or so Dovetail kind of changed their pricing structure, but I do think it was still useful for people to be able to play with it, even if it's just for the 14 day free trial, just so they can see whether this might be something useful to them in the future. I know that many companies use Dovetail for their market research um, and that that tagging feature and transcription feature is really, really powerful. So um, that's something that, you know, I'm just deciding whether how or how I can kind of go about tweaking this in the future. So I have them create that and kind of learn how to um, 
create things like person fields and things like that in their people database. And then we're talking about Zapier. So we get into Zapier in week three of the fellowship where I talk about how to create it um, and then how to use it to have it to where when a new person um, creates or sorry, submits a HubSpot form, uh, then the zap fires to add them to dovetail in their people database. So then I had them be introduced to this new client, Demetria Beatrice demonstration. Um, so they have this recording of their conversation with Demi B demo or De yeah, Demi B demo, which is basically um, Demi is in the Coast Guard. And I base this off of my real life in the sense that I was actually in the Coast Guard. I'm a veteran of the United States Coast Guard, as I mentioned in the beginning. And I wanted them to learn from this experience because out over the course of the weeks, we actually take this interview and we create something for people who are in her situation um, and uh, to help them understand what their rights are when it comes to housing benefits. So that's one piece here as well. So they kind of have this client interview and then I teach them how to take that client interview, upload that into a project in Dovetail and um, and then I kind of go into this piece around what is the jobs to be done framework. So this was a really important idea for me because I want people to start thinking like from the perspective of what is it that from a solutions-based and problem-based perspective, because when you are building a project such as an application or some type of legal technology, you're trying, you're always trying to solve a problem. So you're always starting from someone's problem. And in this case, the framework of how to talk about this is this idea of what is the person's job to be done. So we want to always help the person achieve their job to be done. And we need to identify that and know how to identify that in order to be effective at doing so. So I teach them about your, like your job is to help your customer get their job done fast and accurately. Your customer's struggle with their jobs to be done is what causes a purchase. Products that get the job done sell more faster. Your goal is to build, market, and sell products to get the job done for your customers. So this really comes from this basis from Theodore Levitt, who is a marketing professor at Harvard Business School, who says, People don't want to buy a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. So this is something that's really important and it's something that I wanted them to kind of understand um, throughout this. So we talked a little bit about the traditional buyer persona approach as well as the new jobs to be done critical customer approach. So I think in the future, I think I would still have this section on jobs to be done and this idea of like a customer persona or a critical customer, but I might consolidate this down a little bit more into maybe one or two modules about, about the jobs we've done framework and so on. Um, so we did a deep dive on how to identify customers' needs, um, how to identify unmet customer needs. And then we talked a little bit about um, Clio Grow and Clio Manage and this kind of being part of the conversation around um, customer relationship management as well as project management and why you would use one over the other. And um, so they were all given kind of access to these different platforms during the fellowship in order to kind of compare and contrast as well as to play with and just kind of have room to, uh, to explore these different tools that are being used in a real practice. So I actually had a Clio Manage account when I was practicing law um, and it was great. So I kind of introduced them to those as well. So then we talked a little bit about sales pipelines. So I wanted them to have a business perspective here as well. So we talked about how to create custom sales pipelines within HubSpot, um, deal snippets, how to conduct a conflict check and move your lead through different processes, um, how to use jobs to be done to determine the scope of your representation, as well as potential products or services you could create or offer. And in that particular one, it was important because we were breaking down our client's conversation with us and their interview to say, okay, pulling from there, what are their jobs to be done here? How can we help them? And how can this inspire ideas of how we might be able to create products from this conversation? So that's how we kind of went into that piece. And then I taught them how to install Go Full Page, which is a Chrome extension 
um, so that they could take a screenshot of what would be a much longer web page rather than just a kind of regular screenshot of this area. It would take the full screenshot, which is great. So um, if you're interested in go full page, I also have a free certification course on that, which takes about 42 minutes, which is awesome. So we moved on in week five to create a new contact property in HubSpot for a middle name. So how to kind of really customize your HubSpot um, account and how you want your information to be to be seen. Um, we went on also to uh, do, I think in this particular one, um, I kind of had it be a little bit lighter on this side, but heavier on the automation within Gavel. So we, I had them uh, create and download their digital e-signature in order to go into this piece where we actually automate a limited scope engagement agreement together using Gavel. So the, so in this particular fellowship program, I had them build out four projects. So the first one was the interactive resume. The second one was this limited scope engagement agreement. The third one is a housing um, sort of application for veterans who are disabled. And then the fourth one is their hackathon application. So by the end of this particular fellowship, they had built out four different pieces and applications using Gavel, which has different elements. So some elements were heavier on the word add-in side. Some elements were heavier um, on the sort of uh, logic and sort of understanding of how the different question types feed together, um, efficiency and build strategy, as well as language and who your end customer or your end user is and so on, but each piece kind of built upon the one that came before. So in this one, we had a bit of a longer build um, where we went through step-by-step -step how to do so, how to automate this particular um, one. So then we went into automating this part two. Um, so it breaks down into different subparts. So in this particular one, um, so there was a kind of something I wanted to kind of get across here was around um, after this week, sort of in week seven, um, was around things like psychological safety and um, transparency in a uh, on a team. So when we talk about psychological safety, as well as something called legacy bias, so I'll go into that, um, as well as something called over engineering. So on from a legal tech pedagogy perspective, when we talk about um, things like <laughs> how to teach people about legal technology, one of the things that we want to talk about is when to speak up or how to speak up um, when you see something on a team um, that is a mistake or something that we can be doing better. So this is something that I thought was really important. And so I wanted to show a mistake in order to then correct it, but also have people have the opportunity to correct me, somebody who's in an authority position. Um, to kind of demonstrate this point, which was really useful, I think. And they did pick up on this, which was great. So I was able to have a conversation with them about legacy bias over engineering, radical transparency and psychological safety, curiosity, as well as when you're learning from your mistakes, you're sometimes able to use what you learned in different contexts. So maybe it wasn't appropriate in that particular context. Maybe you use something that you saw somebody do before or in a different context and actually it made sense in theirs, but not really in yours, but you can actually learn and pick up from that. And, and that actually taught us how to create hidden questions and pages in our workflows in the future. So that's a really, really important point here as well. Um, and then we kind of completed this pro bono limited scope engagement agreement and how to customize our sort of email link. So let me kind of go to this piece here. Um, let me get out of here. So I taught them how to cut, use kind of all these customizations. So if we go into the law firm pro bono limited scope engagement agreement. So you're actually able to do quite a lot of customizations with Gavel. And so one of them is this email progress link. So you can change like what this says. You can change what this page says. You can change the email automations that come when somebody submits this. Um, so you really want to think about what is happening in this particular um workflow and when that might be used. So it allows it to kind of save the place and like pass it on to via email. So in this particular case, this was a unique build because we had it to where the lawyer is actually the person who is interacting with the first part of this. 
then they email this progress link to their client to continue the rest of the workflow to, to fill in their pieces of this. So that's kind of a unique aspect of this particular build, which I thought was really fun. So I kind of showed how you can be creative with the different elements that you have that might not be obvious at first. So in week seven, we kind of went through and tidied up our um, templates because the uh, sections and the page numbers didn't make sense at first. So we just added a kind of intentionally left blank piece. I showed them how to, you know, one of the really, one of the things I noticed when I was becoming a gavel expert when I was working with Gigla is that a lot of being a, a gavel expert is actually being a word expert. So there are a lot, there's a whole world of things that you can do in Microsoft Word that, word that you never knew you could do. So a lot of actually understanding how to utilize gavel to its full potential is actually how to utilize Microsoft Word to its full potential. Um, so that is something that we kind of went into in the fellowship as well. So we talked a little bit about this, this idea that I told you about um, conditional documents, legacy bias, over-engineering, radical transparency, curiosity, and the difference between full accounts and student accounts, as well as how to provide feedback and let people know um, from the team what you would want to see as features in the future um, and more. So from this perspective, I also talked to them about in week seven, Clockify. So I had the students create Clockify accounts. So one of the things from a legal tech pedagogy perspective here that I want to highlight is that I wanted to show the students or the fellows not only how to use Gavel, our tool itself, but how Gavel fits within the broader context of your business um, as a whole. So as a law firm or as a sole practitioner, or if you are even just a freelance automator, how to track your time, how to do that with a free tool, how to incorporate um, things like Calendly, Notion, HubSpot, um, Gavel, Softer, and all of these different pieces, how to fit them together. So that was really the main point here and how to understand who your customer is and your end user is um, along the way uh, with that kind of idea of um, this job to be done framework. So we went to on to prepare and send this limited scope engagement agreement to our client by tracking our time in Clockify. Um, and updating our deal in HubSpot, uh, marking our tasks as complete, et cetera, et cetera. And then in week eight, we went on to um, make it to where the, the person signs the agreement, and then we attach those documents to HubSpot and move kind of it through the sales pipeline. So we went on to um, kind of go into um, more around like kind of clockify, tracking time, using dovetail, how to share insights, um, and, and so on. So we kind of went into each of these pieces. Um, and then we kind of went on to part three, which is, de which is developing an idea for your own access to, access to justice app. So I gave them through this, the, um, through this, an example of a veterans housing application sort of uh, thing where we had it to where in our client's case, we wanted to um, we wanted to create something for them that would let them know whether or not they were eligible for a particular type of grant that's offered by the, the government. So in this section, I talked about my formula for coming up with ideas for a new app, which is your personal interest, experience and background, plus research, plus curiosity equals an app or product idea. And then how to scope that idea, meaning how to make it small enough to be something you can do in a particular time frame. So my formula for scoping that is individual technical ability, plus access to resources, such as other team members, stakeholders, people in your target market that can give feedback and so on functionality of available tools, time, and that equals your scope. So we went on in week nine to learn about project management software. So I introduced them to Asana, had them create their free Asana accounts, and then had them kind of do this exercise where we set a timer for 60 minutes and just kind of built an application from scratch based on our research notes. So they could see this kind of how to break the ice of creating something new. Um, we went into how to create customized rules in Asana um, and then compared that to other tools such as Jira, Monday, and so on. Then we went into Airtable. So we went into Airtable, had them create their accounts, 
And then we went into how to create their own app marketplace using Gabble plus Airtable plus Softer, which is kind of a major piece of this whole puzzle, um, which is what we were leading up to basically the whole time. So I, I had them create this application marketplace where somebody could interact with their information like this and sort of go into this details page and then interact with the um, with the uh, particular applications here or purchase them. So it could be kind of like a storefront, for example. So I introduced them also to things like payment processors, such as Stripe, how that compares to things like PayPal um, and so on, and how to integrate Stripe with Gavel as well as Softer, Calendly, HubSpot, and more, and why you would maybe choose Stripe over others. Obviously, for, in my case, I was just explaining that you want to use the thing that integrates with the things that you're using. So Stripe happens to integrate very well with things like Gavel, Software, Calendly, HubSpot, and other tools. So then I have them create that. In week 11, I had them tidy up their marketplaces to have kind of really beautiful images to kind of convey this, because um, originally I had them do screenshots. Then I had them configure comments and user profiles. So the ability to sign in or sign up for, um, you know, this kind of having this profile here, for example, for them to be able to have these different headers based on whether somebody is logged in or not. And the ability to have comment blocks on a list details page. So if we go into here, for example, then you can see that somebody has the ability to make a comment um, and have this ability to um, create comments as well. Um, and somebody who's logged in would then also be able to um, have this little option to edit here. So if we go back to um, the marketplace, maybe I can show you one uh, as well um, here. So what a useful application or whatever else. So I, saw, I taught them how to do that and how to use Airtable as a backend for software. Um, and for your data there. So in the last two minutes, I'm just going to kind of fly through this last little bit, which is to talk about how I went through traditional sales funnels versus the new flywheel approach and three types of customers, which comes really from um, a book about building courses, actually, but it really was helpful in talking about um, interested customers, qualified customers, and committed customers, how they have different pricing tiers, and so on. Um, harmonized business plans, um, we talked about Thinkific and how you can do things like create um, courses, um, live events and communities within Thinkific. And then in week 12, we kind of brought everything together um, to, to have this kind of harmonized system. Um, we went on to take a break. I gave them some bonus lessons. Um, and then uh, we had our hackathon competition, which was really useful because that goes into this kind of future opportunities piece where uh, we gave such prizes as guaranteed paid positions, as well as monetary um, prizes with a thousand dollars for the the for three different categories, as well as some swag prizes. So I'm really proud of the fellowship and what we were able to accomplish with it. If you have any questions about legal tech pedagogy, how to teach legal technology, or um, about the fellowship that we ran, you feel free to reach out to me. Um, just to kind of say quickly that we are, I run this particular um, show once a week, every Wednesday. So you can join me next week. I'll share the topic with you soon um, in the next slide. And then also just to kind of say that if you have any interest in taking any courses with us, you can reach out to me or you can go to the cormeumacademy.com website and check it out. So thank you so much for your time and attention. We'll be here again next week at 10 a.m. Pacific time. I'm actually going to be in Edinburgh for this, so um, that will be fun. I'm going to be talking about building freedom in how embracing no code can lead to self-determination and creative expression. So the three main things that I love about what I get to do is freedom, self-determination, and creative expression. And that's really what I want to be able to convey to other people about what's possible when you come into a, a career in no code and um, legal technology, for example. So feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or by email at Brittany at .pro. If you're interested in anything that relates to Gavel's law school program, you can email me at Brittany at Gavel.io. So thank you all so much for being here with me live. And for those of you that are on the recording, I will see you all next time. Bye, everyone.